Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to News 3's Now Live at 4. No, it's News 3. What is it? News, news now. 3 Now. No, News Now. What? Yeah, I don't know. It's News, news 3. 3 Now. Where's that memo? <laughs> okay, let's start over. Welcome to the program. It's <laughs> News 3 Now at 4. Live at 4. Whatever. <laughs> We're New Year. Did you survive Happy the weekend? Monday. Oh, oh my, my goodness. 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 Susan's on vacation. Charlotte is in. I mean, there was just about everything. No, and I, I think, have you noticed people's tempers are a little bit up getting, there? Getting there, and there's yeah. snow in the forecast every day this week. Okay. Okay. Yes. That's Florida more. looks really good <laughs> right now, doesn't more. it? <laughs> Here's what's making news on this Monday. We'll hear the personal story from a driver involved in that massive winter crash on Highway 41 near Nina. Amanda Quintana is here with that. And the governor is going to propose in his budget this week more money for the UW and freeze tuition. But Rose Schmidt will explain why there's already opposition lining up. And R&B star R. Kelly appears before a Chicago judge today on sexual abuse charges. We'll hear from one of his alleged victims. Let's take a look outside. Kind of not too bad today. The sun was out. Sure, relatively speaking, yeah, right? It could always be worse. <laughs> it could always be, yes, as we found out on Saturday uh -huh. and Sunday. Stay bundled up are the weather words. Dana Fulton's in the backyard where it isn't snowing for right now. For right now, but I can't say the same for everyone. Uh, we are seeing some flurries currently in southern Wisconsin, and we are expecting some flurries uh, throughout the rest of the evening, and as you mentioned, almost every day this week. Live downtown right now, the sky actually doesn't look too bad. A few high, hazy clouds. Uh, it's a little cold, though. We only hit a high of 11 today. That's really where we're at right now. And start of the day, close to zero. And again, with those wind chills, it's felt well below zero all day, all day long. We should have been in the mid 30s for afternoon highs, uh, helping to chip away a little bit at some ice and snow melt. But that just wasn't the case for us. And as we look ahead through the rest of the week, we are going to stay quite chilly. So 11 currently in Madison and in Platteville, about 12 in Mineral Point and in Lone Rock. Same goes for Janesville and Monroe. Again, with the wind chill, though, it feels closer to one for us in Madison. It feels about zero right now in Lone Rock. So a very, very very cold day and uh, it's going to stay cold for the next few days. Our Doppler track showing flurries for some of us. Madison not seeing any flurries right now, but looking towards Platteville and Monroe, we are seeing some light snowfall and we do have the chance to see some light flurries through the next few hours. It won't be much and not really adding any accumulation, but just enough that you may see a few snow snowflakes swirling around. And that is mostly for southern Wisconsin, not really seeing anything off to the north. Looking ahead to your Tuesday and Wednesday, we have added an alert day to the forecast for Tuesday night and throughout the day on Wednesday, snow accumulation totals from one to four inches possible, especially northeast of Madison. So more snow is on the way and it's going to stick with us for just a little bit. It may impact your uh, commute Tuesday night and again on Wednesday morning. We'll take a closer look at some timing with that snow coming through in just a few minutes. Right now, of course, we want to take a look at what's going on on the roadways. First alert traffic update for you. Much of Dane County actually looking fairly green right now. A little closer look at the Beltline, both eastbound and westbound, not seeing any major reductions. A few brake lights there right along the Beltline near 51, uh, but towards 90 and 39 things look OK. Looking up towards a uh, pretty de sac and into the the Dells area. All looks fine. There is a the left lane closure there just south of the Dells on 90, but it seems like that's going to be clearing up. It's not causing major delays along 90 and near Janesville and Jefferson. OK, Fort Atkinson seeing just a few delays closer to downtown. As far as drive times along the Beltline, Janesville to the Beltline northbound will take you just 26 minutes. Middleton to Sox City about 17 and downtown to Sun Prairie just about 16 minutes. So the roads don't seem too bad right now. Of course, we're keeping a close eye on them. Uh, the main focus is just how cold it is outside this evening. So definitely bundle up if you have to go out. Yeah, those winds are rough. Yes, mm -hmm. definitely. Uh, all right, Dan, we'll see you in a few minutes. Thank mm -hmm. you. First at four, a 30-year-old man is dead, and 71 people are recovering from their injuries after yesterday's crash on I-41 that involved 131 vehicles. Unbelievable. Whiteout conditions caused crashes all across the state, with another 20 cars sliding into a ditch near DeForest. Amanda Quintana is here with from with more from the local women who were in that crash near Nina yesterday. Very scary. Yeah, some scary stuff, but at a news conference today, Winnebago County Sheriff said the crash on I-41 was the largest traffic crash in Wisconsin state history. Susan Brueger and Nicole Adrian of Platteville were in that crash. They said the roads were fine until they weren't, and they couldn't see anything. They were able to stop when they saw the road was blocked by cars crashed in front of them, but that's when they were hit from behind, pinning them both inside the car. But when they removed those two do two vehicles and then came to um, my side of the door, um, a fireman had said, there's two people in here and they're still alive. And 
we figured the car looked bad. But that is probably a surreal moment that I'll probably never forget. Wisconsin DOT says having that many crashes in one day is rare, but it's not surprising with yesterday's high winds and blowing snow. That snow quickly turned to ice and there was zero visibility in some spots. At 6, we will hear more from a state trooper who was out helping those 20 cars that crashed on I-3990 near DeForest. He says winter is not over, so we need to be ready for more slippery roads. We need to be ready for those whiteout conditions. It's a rough day on the roads, that's yeah. for mm -hmm. sure. All right, Amanda, thank you. Iowa officials are still urging people to stay off the roads in most of the state because of blowing and drifting snow. Northbound lanes of Interstate 35 that runs north south through the state are still closed from Ames to the Minnesota border. That's more than 100 miles. Semi truck drivers and stranded motorists are backed up in Ames waiting for the highway to open. The southbound lanes opened this morning in most northern Iowa counties. Plows were pulled off the road Sunday because of the limited visibility. Governor Evers will unveil his two-year spending plan on Thursday. Roy Schmidt is here to explain his plans for higher education, which could run into some opposition, Rose. That's right, UW System President Ray Cross is applauding Governor Evers today for his investment in higher education. But parts of his plan are certain to draw pushback from Republican lawmakers. Evers' plan would give a $150 million boost in funding for the UW system and freeze tuition for in-state students. Republican Representative John Nygren, who chairs the state's budget committee, tweeted that Evers continues to make a bipartisan budget nearly impossible. The proposal also includes money for a 2% pay increase for faculty and a study to develop options for refinancing student loans. Multiple students we spoke with today tell us that continuing to freeze tuition could help them out immensely. That's something that I kind of worry about constantly as a student is debt and something that I think we shouldn't have to worry about necessarily and I think that education should be more accessible to everyone no matter what their um, financial situation is. Under one of the more controversial parts of Evers plan, Wisconsin residents who enter the country illegally would be able to pay in-state tuition at UW schools and Wisconsin technical colleges. Governor Walker criticized Evers during the campaign, saying that Evers wanted special treatment for, quote, illegals. Another part of Evers' budget proposal that is drawing criticism from conservatives is his plan to cap enrollment in the state's private voucher program. Senate Majority Leader Scott Fitzgerald says the plan, quote, would do immense harm to the voucher program and create uncertainty for schools, students, and their families. Rose Schmidt reporting. Rose, thank you. Vice President Pence met with Latin American leaders in Colombia today to discuss the ongoing political crisis in Venezuela. He turned up the pressure on Venezuela's Nicolas Maduro, announcing new sanctions against members of his inner circle. Over the weekend, troops loyal to the embattled president fired tear gas and rubber bullets at, Venu at Venezuelan citizens trying to reach U.S. aid. To those members of Venezuela's armed forces, you will find no safe harbor. No easy exit, no way out. During his trip to Colombia, Pence met with opposition leader Juan Guaido, who declared himself Venezuela's interim president last month. The two leaders delivered humanitarian aid to Venezuelans who fled to Colombia. President Donald Trump has embarked on a trip to Hanoi, Vietnam, for a second sit-down summit with North Korean leader Kim Jong-un. The president says the goal of the summit is to work towards the denuclearization of North Korea. Natalie Brand has more details from the White House. President Trump departed Washington for Hanoi, Vietnam, ahead of a second summit with North Korean leader Kim Jong-un. I think we can have a very good... A very good summit. I think we'll have a very tremendous summit. President Trump has a primary goal for the meeting. We want denuclearization. While the North Koreans have not conducted missile tests for the past 400 days, Trump administration officials acknowledge getting North Korea to give up its nuclear program will be a slow process. We've always known this would take time and, and it would be a step forward and uh, slower than the, the world has demanded. Trump administration officials also acknowledge that North Korea so far has not taken concrete steps towards denuclearization. Some lawmakers worry President Trump could give up too much ground without getting much back. We could run the risk uh, that Kim is given concessions which are not accompanied 
by real concessions that the United States is receiving uh, in return. Lawmakers and regional experts are especially concerned about a potential drawdown of U.S. troops stationed in South Korea. But the president says that won't happen. Is drawing down U.S. troops a consideration in your upcoming summit with North Korean Kim Jong-un? No, it's not. That is not one of the things on the table. The summit between President Trump and North Korean leader Kim Jong-un is expected to last one to two days. On Capitol Hill, Natalie Brand for News 3 Now. A Florida woman who worked for President Trump's 2016 campaign claims during a meeting with staff and volunteers, he grabbed her by the hand and kissed her. Alva Johnson contends in the federal lawsuit filed today that Trump made the unwanted advance in August 2016 in Tampa. R. Kelly remains jailed in Chicago on sexual abuse charges involving four women, including three who were underage at the time. He went before a judge in Chicago today, arraigning, arraigned on 10 counts of aggravated sexual abuse. His lawyer entered a not guilty plea to the charges. The singer is reportedly struggling to come up with the $100,000 needed to make bail. One of the alleged victims held a news conference this afternoon and said she feels the need to speak out. I came out for the purpose of telling my story because this has gone on for far too long. And it's been like 20 years, you know, since this happened to me. But it was so important for me to come out because he has to be stopped. If convicted on all charges, Kelly could face up to 70 years in prison. Kelly's lawyer says he expects he'll be released from jail either this evening or tomorrow. Stocks ended the day higher as a trade deal with China appears to be close at hand. The Dow Industrials gained 60 points, closing at 26,091. The Nasdaq Composite Index and added 26, and the S&P 500 was up 3. At least five popular health and fitness apps have stopped sharing sensitive user data with Facebook. This move comes after a Wall Street Journal investigation. The journal found 11 apps shared personal information, including users' body weight, blood pressure, and pregnancy status with Facebook. The social media giant says it is telling the app developers to stop sending the sensitive information. The company is also working on new systems to detect and block information sharing by apps. That's scary. It is. Just keep that in mind when you open up an app. Mm -hmm. Just be mindful of what you put out there. <laughs> Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Well, there's more to come at four. When we come back, we'll head to the movies with film critic Will Loper. We'll find out what he thinks of How to Train Your Dragon, The Hidden World, and have an Oscar Awards wrap-up. That's when Live at Four continues.
I've hunted every night, Fury. Except yours. Hand him over. I will never give him up. Then I will destroy everything you love. We are no longer safe here. We all have to disappear completely off the map. We have to fight for their freedom. Well, that was a clip from Train Your Dragon, The Hidden World, one of the newest movies to fly into theaters over the weekend. Is the third film in the Dragon series worth seeing? Here's Will Loper to let us know. Third one already. I can't believe Third it. Third one, and they say it's the last, but uh, I wouldn't hold your breath. Yeah. They always say that. They always say that. So this film will deliver all the fire-breathing action and dragon-flying adventure you could ask for. Both kids and adults will find plenty to enjoy in this film. So Jay Baruchel voices Hiccup, leader of his village, which has successfully incorporated dragons into everyday life, even if the amount of dragons increases every day and puts strain on the village. However, an evil dragon hunter decides he wants Hiccup's rare night fury dragon, named Toothless, and Hiccup and the rest of his dragon-flying friends must decide whether to run or to fight. The movie is gorgeously animated. There were points in the movie I just wanted to pause it and admire how they had animated something like the sand. It just looks so good. Story is predictable, but it gets the job done. If you have little ones need entertainment for two hours, a trip to the theater for this movie, you'll get the job done. And the parents aren't going to be bored? No, no, they aren't. I mean, I, I definitely think the first one is the best of this bunch, and it's kind of been diminishing returns every time, but I was entertained through the whole thing, so. All right, good. So what's the rating? Yeah, this one, 3.5 Hobgobbler Dragons out of 5. These are the smallest, chubbiest, and cutest <laughs> of the dragons in the film. So, pretty good rating. Pretty good, yeah. All right, let's talk about the Oscars last night. Yes. Some surprises and some not-so-surprises. Yeah, I mean, uh, Rami Malek for Best Actor. Obviously, that was the lock. Very guaranteed win. Um, Roma winning Best Foreign Film Directing and Cinematography. I think we all knew Roma would pick up at least Foreign Film and Cinematography. But, yeah, I mean, definitely a few surprises. Olivia Coleman winning Best Actress for The Favored, beating out both Glenn Close and Lady Gaga, but she gave really a truly surprised and wonderful acceptance speech. To be in this category with these extraordinary women and Glenn Close, I, you've been my idol for so long and this is not how I, I wanted it to be and I, I think you're amazing. I love you very much. Green Book. Yeah, I think the biggest shock though might have been Green Book taking Best Picture, being out the expected winner Roma as well, which oh, wow. did make some happy. I guess Spike Lee attempted to leave the theater early and was quoted as saying that every time there's a movie about somebody driving somebody, he loses. <laughs> Referencing 1990 when Driving Miss Daisy yeah. took home Best Pick and his film Do the Right Thing wasn't even nominated. But, oh. And it was a night of diversity as well. Absolutely, and some firsts as well. We had Ruth E. Carter and Hannah Beachler. They were the first African-American women to win for costume design and production design, respectively, for Black Panther, which also ended up winning Best Score. But I think Green, the Best Picture winner, I think it surprised a lot of people. Absolutely. I mean, a lot of people are saying Roma, uh, Bohemian Rhapsody even. I was kind of gunning for A Star is Born myself, but seeing Green Book take it, Lob jaws dropped. Some people are saying there's a backlash with Romo and Netflix. Yeah. They don't, the studios don't like that. They're still Hollywood, not quite wanting to expect, uh, accept Netflix as an awards contender, and maybe that may have played into why Roma didn't win Best Pictures. You know, I thought it was, without well, a host, it was a great show. Yeah. I mean, it moved right along. Uh, yeah, I didn't miss a host at all. Good evening, and welcome to the one millionth Academy Awards. I was a little sad, Amy Poehler, Maya Rudolph, and Tina Fey, I saw them in the beginning, I'm like, great host right here, but otherwise, yeah, it was fine without a host. All right, so start getting the nominees for next year. That's right. Uh, what are we doing next all week? over again. Uh, next week we have Greta, which is a thriller starring Chloe Grace Moretz as a girl who finds handbags all over the city and returns one, and the woman may be crazy who's leaving them all over. Interesting for us. Uh, we'll see. <laughs> all right, well, thank you. Thank you very much. And we'll be right back. This is News 3 Now, live at 4.
Well, take a look at this video of strong winds pushing ice boulders over a retaining wall near the Niagara River is equal parts cool, bizarre, and scary. Authorities shared the video warning drivers to proceed with caution. One roadway had to be closed due to the encroaching ice. Frigid winter weather has been the source of many striking images from the area. In January, parts of the normally rushing Niagara Falls froze, resembling a mountain of ice. But this latest video of ice in the park can be summed up in one word, moving. Wow. Isn't that something? Very oh. cool. So we are not sure <laughs> that this next story will make our weather woes worse or maybe give us hope. Hopefully a little hope. It hit 66 <laughs> degrees in London oh, today. No wow. near that here. That's officially the warmest February day in the city since records have been kept. And of course, those records go back centuries. Bees are buzzing oh, and wow. cherry blossoms are blooming <laughs> as spring is completely in the air. People enjoying time at Regent's Park weren't complaining about the warm weather, but it also had some, of course, worrying about climate change. Keep in mind, however, on this day last year, the capital city was shivering under a thick blanket of snow. Oh, but just savor just, that. Just look at that. Just look at the sun and oh, be happy beach. for our friends Flowers. across the right, pond. Right. It's coming eventually. Yes, yeah. Not, well, this, not this week. Not this week, mm -hmm. probably not next week. Um, probably probably not for a, a minute, but we are <laughs> going to get spring at some point, and it's going to be nice out. Uh, if you're a fan of snow, I've got good news for you. Your forecast right after the break. Great. A little bit of everything for us this weekend. We saw, of course, the snow and wind and rain and freezing rain. It's a few thunderstorms also. Uh, right now, we're just looking at a very cold night, bit of a breeze for us this evening, and also, of course, our flurry is still coming through along the southwest corner of the state towards much of Grant County right now, seeing flurries. We are seeing a few flurries just north of Madison, but it's just outside, nothing coming down for us currently in Madison. But don't be surprised if you do see a few snowflakes swirling around through the rest of the evening. It's really just this little area that's still 
still moving through the state line. We'll continue to see that slide east and then kind of calm down closer. We get to about 10 11 o'clock. No more snowfall expected as we head into tomorrow morning. However, by tomorrow evening, another chance for snow is going to come in and that round is going to bring a little more accumulation for us. So throughout the day on Tuesday, plan on a mostly cloudy sky. That snowfall comes in late in the day. We'll start off with some flurries and then light snow expected overnight. And that light snow may mix with some freezing drizzle at times. Overnight into Wednesday morning, we continue to see snowfall by Wednesday morning. Early in the day, our snow gradually tapers off, turning to flurries and then just ending for us again west to east. And then by Wednesday afternoon, we actually have a partly sunny sky. We'll get the cloud coverage out of here as well. But because of the timing, your commute for Tuesday night and Wednesday morning likely both impacted with the snow coming on through. So temperatures for us overnight are going to stay quite chilly. Again, a slight chance for a few flurries for us just in the next few hours. By tomorrow morning, temperatures are going to drop close to zero to start off the day. It will be mostly cloudy and then later in the afternoon and early evening, that flurry chance starts to come back in. And that is again going to add up to a little bit of accumulation for us. Anywhere from one to three inches really expected throughout southern Wisconsin falling between your Tuesday evening commute and your Wednesday morning commute. Most of it though is going to stay north of southern Wisconsin to central Wisconsin for us. Temperatures on Wednesday will be in the low 20s for afternoon highs. Now looking at that expected snowfall one to three inches likely for us with slighter amounts to the south. The totals start to get a little higher the closer you get to Sheboygan and Fond du Lac. Uh, they could see up to two to five inches of snowfall again that trend a gradient there the lesser amounts to the south west and higher amounts expected to the northeast. So because of that snow chance, we do have an alert day in the forecast for Tuesday night and for Wednesday uh, because your commutes are going to be impacted by that snow coming on through. And then the concern, of course, once the snowfall does end on Wednesday, are we going to have any blowing or drifting snow that will impact our roads again? So that's snow accumulation on top of what we already have on the ground. And we have had quite a snowy February, already 21 and a half inches of snowfall this month. We should have picked up closer to about 10 and a half inches of snow. So we are well above average in the last few weeks. Temperatures over the next 12 hours are going to stay quite cold heading into tomorrow morning. We are going to drop close to zero with those wind chills falling well below zero for us to start off your Tuesday. Anywhere from, uh, you know, five to 20 degrees below zero as far as what it feels like outside. Bitterly cold, that light snow and flurry chance possible for us heading into tomorrow morning and then a break for us tomorrow morning. And then tomorrow afternoon that or evening, the light snow picks back up, especially later on in the day. High temperature for your Tuesday, close to 18. And we are going to stay below average for the next uh, stretch of time through your 10 day forecast. We should be in the mid 30s and it doesn't look like we're going to get anywhere close to that. 18 degrees your high for Tuesday in the mid 20s for Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, hopping up just a little bit. But we're expecting another round of snow to come in on Friday. That flurry chance popping up almost every day and then a very cold weekend ahead for us. We'll be seeing highs in the teens and of course those overnight lows falling well below zero. Uh, yes, the snow chances staying. The cold air is staying. We're not looking at much of a warm up until we start to get into the middle of March. Seven the months. middle of March. I know. Well, March is Friday. Well, yes, but you know what the middle is? <laughs> it's, a long it's a little more time. We get through the 10 day <laughs> forecast and then we are looking all the way out to the middle of the month before we start to see a climb where we get warmer as an above average warmer. So the morning yes. commute tomorrow should be okay. It's the afternoon. The morning commute tomorrow really mm -hmm. should be okay. Yes, but as, as we were talking about earlier, there's still some spots that are just ice ponds mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. now. So even though we don't have snow falling, yeah. that doesn't mean you, you shouldn't take it a little slower or yes. be very aware of the road conditions. Great. <laughs> what can you say at this yeah. point? Mm -hmm. Let it snow. Let it snow. <laughs> Let it Sorry, guys. Thanks, it's, Dana. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Plastic is contained in almost every product we buy, much of it single use plastic that ends up getting tossed. But now there is an effort to change that. CBS News' Farah Fazal takes you inside the zero waste movement. At the refill shop in Ventura, California, there's a wide assortment of bath and beauty products. But it's what's not here that makes this place unique. I just kind of have the crazy idea. Owner Michelle Stevens' idea led to a store where items aren't sold in prepackaged plastic bottles. It's refills only. Oh, I wonder if people really would bring their own containers in over and over. And they have. And for those who don't want to bring their own, Michelle offers empty glass and plastic bottles that can be reused. In the eight years that she has been open, Michelle has filled 30,000 refills from bottles like these. 
Packaging accounts for nearly 15 million tons of plastic created every year, and most of it ends up in landfills or the ocean. Michelle's shop is just one of many zero waste stores popping up around the nation that's trying to change that. At PreCycle in Brooklyn, to buy any of the produce, pastas, or even oil, shoppers have to bring their own containers. Well, I love it, and I like buying things um, package free, so that's really big for me. The idea isn't just catching on with small stores. Coca-Cola, Procter & Gamble, and several other global corporations recently announced a new initiative called Loop. This summer, 25 companies will sell certain products in glass and other containers that can be collected, cleaned, refilled, and reused. We're just really trying to make a little less trash in the world. Michelle is trying to launch more shops like the refill shop. She believes every sale means one less plastic bottle going to waste. Vera Fazal, CBS News, Ventura, California. I like that. That's a great idea. Like I was telling you, I have a friend here in Madison who brings her own containers to the grocery store for, for all of that stuff, for you know vegetables, produce. And, and they can weigh it out stuff. and stuff? Apparently so. She's been doing this for years. That's why she's not a store like that in Madison. All right, somebody out All there, right. come up with it. <laughs> get, get at it. <laughs> Still to come at four. Science can be tough, but yet a fun subject to teach. But there's a top-notch teacher in Janesville who has no choice but to get creative because of her students' abilities. And she is proving that learning is always possible. We'll meet her next. This just in from the Channel 3000 Alert Center. Wisconsin Governor Tony Evers has announced that he will be withdrawing Wisconsin National Guard troops from the southwest border. About 112 soldiers and airmen are currently serving in Arizona where they've been deployed to assist with border security. More on that coming up at 5.
Well, we've known for decades that teachers sometimes have to get creative when teaching certain lessons. Well, imagine how creative you'd have to be to teach science to students who are blind. For Kathy Arndt, there's nothing she can't teach because she knows her students have what it takes to go straight to the head of the class. We're gonna start out with passing out some of the stethoscopes, and so I want you to look for your own heartbeat. You should be able to feel that come up. Okay, now take that in your hand. And I really enjoy teaching the science hands-on. Do you hear it, uh, Yeah. Hands-on and finding different ways to teach basic science principles are a must here. I came with the attitude of learning from the kids and learning how to teach them from them. After being only the second ag teacher in all of Wisconsin back in the day, Kathy Arndt now teaches science at the Wisconsin School of the Blind and Visually Impaired in Janesville. I'm adamant about these kids being on the same playing field as other children, and I really want them to understand the world around them the way that a sighted child has an opportunity to do. The experiment does not specify the amount. Because of that determination, she brings the world to them. Sighted people are able to see these animals in National Geographic or in magazines. Children who have no vision are never going to experience these animals unless they are actually able to touch them very important to have all the different uh, creatures that we have here. I even have a piece of polar bear fur. And Kathy spends countless hours researching. I don't use a textbook much, do we? I mean, I'll get it out and I'll say, okay, we're on this page, and it kind of ends there. It worked. What else? Yeah. Ours worked too, Ms. Arndt. She always finds a way to bring science to life, from understanding the human heart to actually playing with fire. I think it's because we do experiments all the time. And With, of course, proper supervision. I try everything I can to move the blocks aside and still have them learn. If there's a way that I can possibly teach it, I will do it. These aren't just students to Kathy. They're her kids. My hope is that they will find happiness in their future and feel that they're contributing to the world around them. I think the population in general doesn't recognize uh, people who are blind as capable contributors to our world. And I would hope that someday that would change. You guys did a good job today. Thank you. Hmm. Kathy, congratulations, and thank you for doing what you do every day. If you know a top-notch teacher who deserves to be recognized, let me know. You can nominate them at channel3000.com under the Education tab. What a very special teacher she is. Oh, she's fantastic. Yeah, congratulations, the students Kathy. love her. All right, it's time to get your medical questions answered. The number to call to talk to Dr. Zorba Pastor is 270-9933. Zorba is standing by live at his clinic in Oregon. Hi, Zorba. What are we talking about today? It's a good day. Hi, guys. We're going to talk about working women and depression, and if they work too long, they might have problems.
Again, we do have a few slick spots on the roads. Of course, uh, there are some icy portions. Much of Dane County, though, looks okay. And no accidents to report, which is always a good thing. Looking at the belt line right now, speeds eastbound reduced just a little bit as you get closer to Rimrock Road, down to about 40 miles per hour, but closer to Gammon at about 60 miles per hour. Up towards the northwest corner around Prairie du Sac and the Dells, all looks just fine. Again, that one spot we were looking at on 90 just south of the Dells, all cleared out right now. Both north and southbound look okay. And near Janesville and Jefferson County, Rock County, all looks fine as well. Again, a few slowdowns the closer you get to Janesville and also the closer you get to downtown Fort Atkinson, but no major delays at this time. As far as your drive times go, northbound from Janesville to the Beltline will take you just about 26 minutes. Middleton to Sauk City at about 17 minutes. The same goes northbound from downtown to Sun Prairie. And if you are heading from northbound from Verona to the Beltline, just about five minutes. So a little bit of a reduction there as the average speed is dropping just a little more. A few more folks hopping on the road from Oregon to the Beltline about seven minutes and only four minutes from Springfield eastbound to University Avenue. That's a quick look at your first alert traffic. Dana, thank you. Imagine being on this flight. This is a British Airways plane moments Yikes. before it was supposed to land the Gibraltar International Airport. It violently rocks back and forth as it battles strong crosswinds. The plane was diverted to the Malaga Airport and the plane did land safely with no injuries. That had to be a little scary on there. Oh, a whole lot scary. All right, Dr. Zorba Pastor standing by at his office in Oregon, taking your calls at 270-9933. If you're on the line, stay there. We'll get to your calls in just a sec. Hi, Zorba, how are you? Good. Very good, thanks. We're looking at long working hours linked to heightened depression risk in women. Yay. What's the study about? Oh, right. Right. This is a study that was just published in the British Medical Journal, and it's part of a longitudinal study that's taking place in the United Kingdom. They looked at men, they looked at women, about 40,000 men and women in total, and they looked at the men and women who worked 55 hours or longer for the week. So they might have a 40-hour job, and they might have a part-time job with it, or they might have two or three part-time jobs. And then they looked at mental health, and lo and behold, they found that women, more than men, women who worked 55 hours a week or more were at a greatly, a much higher risk for depression. Part of the reason they think may be that a lot of women have to go home and then they have chores to do at home, but they're not exactly sure why, but there really is a take home message. The women who worked weekends were much more likely to be depressed. The women who worked work hours where they worked at night were more likely to be depressed. And what was very important is that women who sought help because they had depression actually improved because they went, they saw their doctor, their health care provider, and actually got help. So the bottom line here is if you're working 50 or 55 hours a week and you're depressed, you are not alone. And the answer may be to either seek help from your health care provider or to seek help at home so that you can get rid of some of those chores that actually are part of the depression syndrome that's hmm. occurring. Very, very interesting data. Very important for any woman who works long hours. Yeah, try to change the situation yeah. if possible. Yep. Make it better. All right, we got some calls waiting, so let's get to the phones. We'll start with Diane in Madison. Hi, Diane. Hi, how are you? Great. What's your question? Good. Okay. How you doing, Dr. Zorba? Very good, thanks. Um, my question is, after a person has knee surgery, how long should that person stay on pain medications? And this is part two. And if they are on that medication, what is the time frame that they should stay on that? Because we know that some opi opiates are kind of pain, uh, pain medications can lead to a, an addiction. So how Absolutely. long would you suggest Absolutely. that they should well, stay on that med? You, you bring up a good point. The, fir the, 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 the short answer is as little as possible. And quite often orthopedic surgeons will give a huge amount. They'll give maybe 60 tablets or 100 tablets and say take them until you feel better. And we now know that when that occurs, you're at a higher risk for addiction. So anti-inflammatories, which often orthopedic surgeons say you have to stay away from, are not used. Arthritis strength Tylenol, it's an eight hour pill, two tablets every eight hours will help a lot of people. And then you want to taper off those opioids as soon as you can. And that's critical. And I'll give a perfect example that happened in my office today. Young man came in, he never had any drug problem, went to the dentist, had wisdom teeth removed, had hydrocodone, had only four tablets and said, gee, this feel good, this feels good. And he ultimately became addicted from that. He has fought that addiction successfully, but it was just that little bit of opioid that made a difference so the answer is less is best yeah, it doesn't take Bottom. much mm -hmm. 
All does right. not take much. No. Let's go to Mary from Madison. Hi, Mary. What's your question? Yeah, um, I was wondering what to do about low back pain. Well, first of all, best thing for low back pain is to get out of bed and start to move. We used to put people in bed for one week, then we found out that was wrong. Then we put people in bed for three days, we found out that was wrong. The best thing to do for back pain is as soon as you can, get up and start moving. Back exercises are excellent. Go to the web, Google back exercises, Google them from the Mayo Clinic or Google them from a reliable source, and there are great exercises that you can do. And then anti-inflammatories, two leaf tablets twice a day, for a week can often help people with low back pain. And then of course there's massage, there's chiropractic, and there's yoga. And physical therapy too as well? Mm -hmm. And physical therapy of course. All right, we were talking at the top of the show how crabby people are because of this weather. Any advice yeah. besides going to Florida for a week? I, exist, I think you should have prayers for warmer weather. That's probably about the advice that I can get. But it's very difficult when it's cold like this. I think getting out and doing something is really important. We get, you know, we get cabin fever because we don't want to go outside. And that, of course, is a problem. That's about my, my advice. I don't recommend that you go on any pills. You just have to get outside <laughs> as soon as it's warm. It will warm up eventually. Zarba, thank you. Thank you, everyone, thank for calling you. in. We'll see, a pleasure, you, guys. see you soon. We'll have a final check of your forecast coming up. Quiet before some more snow. Some more snow, yes. And some areas right now are actually already seeing some mm. flurries. Uh, so we may have a few more flurries tonight and this evening. Not expecting any accumulation along with that, though. It is cold outside. We're at about 11 right now in Madison, closer to 12 in Mineral Point and Monroe. Uh, as far as your wind chill goes, it does feel a little closer to zero for most of us. And if you're going further north towards Viroqua or Camp Douglas, it feels below zero. Our next chance for significant snow will come through Tuesday night and into Wednesday, it's a significant, more measurable snowfall uh, right for your Tuesday evening commute and your Wednesday morning commute. So we do have an alert day in the forecast for that overnight transitional period where, where the snow will be coming through. I love that background on that graphic. Oh, snow the, and just ice. the snow <laughs> blowing across the road. Just That's got, what we were dealing with this weekend. Pretty accurate. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Pretty <laughs> sure. All right, Daniel, thank you. Tomorrow here on Live Before, Lisa Briggs from the Bruce Company will be along to take your plant and garden questions live. And have we reached the tipping point? How much and who should you tip? Consumer Reports has some advice.